Hello everyone, and I'm glad that you've joined us today. I um, apologize if I'm a little rusty for the uh, technology. I would like to actually begin the presentation with the background uh, to, the, to the information. Currently in the United States, there are 50 regulatory boards shaping the scope of pharmacy practice, pharmacy technician practice. Entry into the profession varies by each state's board of pharmacy, and each state board or each state's educational requirements for entry span the range of achieving a high school diploma to completion or a formalized education program. Currently, formalized pharmacy technician education programs are programmatically accredited through a collaboration of the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education and the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, known as the Pharmacy Technician Accreditation Commission. That's a mouthful. The PTAC Commission evaluates the extent the accreditation standard is achieved through assessment data, the results, and the associated quality of the program. This webinar will identify how the assessment of program learning outcomes, curriculum alignment, planning, and the student experience support the accreditation and the quality of the pharmacy technology program. So moving ahead, I just want to give just a bit of background for the accreditation basics. And there are two types of educational accreditation. One is institutional, and the other is specialized or programmatic. Institutional accreditation normally applies to the institution as a whole. So whenever we think about institutional level, we're thinking about a whole facility, either a, 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 a whole school, a university, or such. And then the specialized accreditation normally applies to the evaluation of a program, a department, or a school which make up the whole institution. The specialized accreditation, generally we see that in vocational type programs, but it may exist as well in non-educational settings such as hospitals or certain type of pharmacies. There's also some assessment basics that I would like to share. And in that, start the whole process with the end in mind. In other words, go to the standard that you'll be evaluating and read through that information start with that process so that you can work the equation backwards. This will ensure that you have an aligned and integrated assessment and accreditation practice. Also recognize that assessment is not a once and done project. It is an ongoing project it hardly has an absolute beginning or ending. And that outcomes-based assessment is actually rooted in student learning, not in teaching focus. With outcomes-based assessment, our goal is really to understand what our students know and have learned. I'm sure that some would disagree with this, but really the only wrong way, the only wrong method of assessment or the approach to assessment is simply not to do it or to ignore its practice. We can all improve on any process, so by its very nature, if you decide that an assessment method is not working, you can change that uh, for, for future assessment practices. 
We also need to balance the mixture of the types of assessment and the instruments used in, in our process. It doesn't need to be, and our assessment practices do not need to only have one type, either direct or indirect measurements. Thinking about the perspectives that we should use for assessment, whenever we realize that learning is at the center, we should also evaluate its effectiveness and then how relevant are our assessment practices in what we're doing. Keep the whole process as simple and clean as possible because an assessment system will fall under its own weight if there are too many complexities in the process. My motto uh, toward assessment is design it backward and deliver it forward. So with that being said, if we can advance the slide, please. In speaking about learning outcomes, uh, we'll begin with program outcomes. We'll move to course outcomes, the sources and how to evaluate them along with the measurements. Just as I said before, if we start with the end in mind, we need to think about how program outcomes shape the whole learning environment. Whenever we address program outcomes, we go to many sources for these outcomes to determine what they will look like. We may go to our state regulation, we may go to our boards of pharmacy, we may go to our employers, we may go to our clinical environments, we may go to our uh, students themselves, uh, we may uh, consult practice analysis. We, we will use multiple sources to shape the program outcomes for, for our program. So with that being said, we also need to align our program outcomes with our accreditation standard. We need, we need to have that, that in picture in mind whenever we think about the accreditation standard and what our program needs to look like, we're starting with our end in mind. Also in our program outcomes, we need to have formative and summative assessment data at the appropriate part of, of our program and our program outcomes as well as our course outcomes should certainly be a mixture of direct and indirect measures. What is the appropriate type of data to collect in terms of program outcomes, course outcomes, or these sources. Again, whenever we start with the end in mind and we begin with an accreditation standard related to our field of study, in this case with pharmacy technology programs, we will begin to see the threads needed for program, course, and our measurements in that, from, from that standard. Going in one level from program outcomes to course outcomes, our course outcomes will help our students to identify the particular skills, knowledge, and abilities that will be expected from that particular course. The course outcomes should be aligned to the program outcomes, which are then aligned to our accreditation standard. The mechanism for recording all of this information needs to be uh, usable. Again, it doesn't need to be so large that uh, you can't manage it. And it needs to be a system either 
a software package or your learning management system. Either one of those things could, could work here. Also, whenever you are determining course and program outcomes, look at, at those in terms of what constitutes achievement of those outcomes. Will you evaluate those outcomes by rubrics? Or will you use other uh, classroom assessment techniques in identifying whether or not a student has learned? Because we know that grades themselves are not the only measure of the learning. In fact, grades may be the least appropriate measure of outcomes or competencies within, a, within a, a field of education or a field of study for a student. So with that in mind, if we will go to our next slide, we can see an example of a rubric used in one particular outcome of a program this rubric would be considered a direct measurement and it is this particular one has been constructed in Microsoft Excel by an actual program owner and and the the rubric is assessing how well a student has performed receiving the prescription that in turn is part of the accreditation standard. So this particular item can be used to help a program owner communicate to what extent their student has met this particular outcome. Moving to the next slide, is an example of how a program owner could use a curriculum map or a crosswalk as it's sometimes referred to in a manner of identifying the program outcomes and mapping those to the course level outcome. So on the left hand side you see that this particular program owner has identified several program outcomes related to their pharmacy technology program. Across the top, you see course outcomes then, or course objectives and outcomes, and sometimes that terminology is one and the same for some people. Um, whenever you see that under the course outcome uh, introduction to pharmacy technology, that particular course says that, that at the end, the student will recognize basic aspects of professionalism in the pharmacy setting. That objective then helps this program owner fulfill the program outcome of exhibiting professionalism. There's also another outcome in the right hand column under pharmacy applications that's also used to help determine if the program outcome exhibiting professionalism has been attained. Again, this is one method, not the only method, but one method to show how the data and what types of data are being collected. Under each course outcome, Again, remember there's a backstory there that students have genuine artifacts, either tests, projects, competencies, um, skill checkoffs, that also will help to determine if that student has in fact attained the course outcome as well as the program outcome. Moving to the next slide. You see yet another 
measurement or another instrument used in the collection of outcome data, this particular survey would go to maybe a, a preceptor or a clinical site coordinator asking for their opinion related to areas of instruction that are now connected um, to our accreditation standard, this particular aspect would help us to understand another perspective for that. So, if we gave this survey to our clinical site, and our clinical site coordinator evaluated our student, we could take this information, measure it against maybe a student evaluation and a faculty evaluation to get a 360 degree picture of what our student has actually learned related to each aspect within the accreditation standard. You can see that by having three measures to help see the whole picture, we're not only using grades to identify the outcomes that students have learned. If we'll move to the next slide, We'll move into, um, you, you've heard me speak now several times about standards and the accreditation. The pharmacy technology programs are programmatically accredited through ACPE and ASHP, and the accreditation for pharmacy technology programs does exist. The actual link will be presented toward the end of this webinar on the final slides, and in, in that accreditation standard, it's very important not only to read it literally, but also to think about that standard from a, from a larger picture. Again, I, at the beginning I said start with the end in mind. If you've never spent time reading an accreditation standard, you have to think about the language that's used there as well as having a context for even understanding that standard. In the case of the pharmacy technology programs, the accrediting body does offer what is called the model curriculum. Now we'll show you an example of the types of information that's in that. We spoke briefly um, about crosswalks and curriculum maps in uh, a couple of previous slides. So that language is also in the standard. And then we are now seeing where publishers are producing ancillary documents that will help program owners, faculty members, and others to, to understand how the context or the text uh, actually relates to the standard. So I'll show you examples of that as well. If you'll go to the next slide, please. This particular information is a breakdown of how the model curriculum is uh, constructed. And in the first column, you see the objective. One thing I want to note here is that in your accreditation standard, the term objective and in your educational setting, the term objective may be functioning the same way, but may have different names. It's up to you to be aware of how those items are being used in your environment and then um, adopt and embrace them in that environment. So the model curriculum from ASHP uses the terms goals and objectives as the high level 
and, and assessment language is, those would equate to outcomes. In the model curriculum, the term objective are the measurable specific items that learners uh, must do to achieve that associated goal. They're also given instructional objectives, uh, which further break down the learning and then uh, put this in context to Bloom's taxonomy. The next three columns are activities related to didactic simulation and experiential, and, and those are just examples related to those, um, those aspects of the curriculum. So from that you can, you can see the different types of data that you would need to uh, organize in terms of didactic simulation and experiential. The next slide shows the ancillary alignment. This particular one is actually from um, the Pharmacy Lab text showing the instructional objective, again in the domain related to that objective. And this particular um, item is showing you across a text series where in that series this particular uh, objective then is addressed and, and what types of activities can be used to meet this objective. Our next area speaks to the relevancy of pharmacy technology programs. And whenever we think about relevancy, really we need to be asking ourselves what measures of quality are we using to keep our curriculum uh, relevant and our programs relevant. So the first bullet point I have here is curriculum. If our curriculum has been mapped according to the goals and objectives, we should really begin to see a picture of any gaps or any areas where a, a topic has been overemphasized. We should be able to visually see that through a curriculum map or a crosswalk. We also need to find out if our curriculum is still aligned with the practice of today's practice and if it's still aligned with the appropriate standard. Job analysis occurs for uh, within the practice and we need to determine if our curriculum then is aligned to that to that job practice anal task analysis because if we do not use assessment to modify our curriculum we may be teaching outdated items or we may not be teaching items that are current in the marketplace. Additionally, we should use our strategic planning and our advisory committees, those functions, we should be using those to keep our programs relevant because through our strategic planning as a measure of quality, then we should constantly be looking for short-term goals and long-term goals. And again, there's data related to that strategic planning that it's relevant, that, that it's essential that we collect um, evidence to provide to our audiences that say, yes, you know, we've met this or, or no, this is what our need is. Um, how can we substantiate a need if we are not doing our strategic planning homework? Also, through our advisory committee, we will keep our curriculum and our programs current because our advisory committee must be a broad-based group that will act as the pulse of the profession the curriculum, or I'm sorry, the accreditation standard 
speaks to the role of the advisory committee and we should, we as program owners need to harness that, um, that information, collect that information from our advisory committee, process that into our curriculum, make certain that it's aligned with practice and our standard, and then we will have a truly relevant program and truly relevant curriculum. We can go to the next slide. You can see this particular example can be uh, used uh, to actually help our advisory committee determine if a student has in fact attained each of the goals and objectives related with the curriculum. This is a very concise method and this is not the full document. However, this was a nice example from a program owner that shows us very well the related goal from the standard in the center column under ASHP goals broken down by skills related to those goals and then by activity related to those skills. At the moment that the student has then been evaluated, uh, self-evaluation, program owner evaluation, preceptor evaluation, you now have, again, that triangulation of information that will help you to see how those students have attained those goals and those competencies. And you can use one such instrument to be able to achieve that goal. If we can look at the next slide, you can see yet a, another example of how you can collect this information or what type of information to collect. This particular instrument states the, the, the practice area, the sterile and non-sterile compounding, how that relates to the particular goal within the framework or the standard, and then uses the activities related to this particular goal. You can use a similar uh, rating scale if you so choose. Using the same instrument in more than one area, again, helps you to validate your data. Moving from the actual relevance into our next slide, which is effectiveness. We speak to four areas related to program assessment that the accreditation standard identifies. Section 5.5 .5 of the accreditation standard says that programs will measure but will not be limited to performance on national certification or, or uh, licensure exams, completion rates, satisfaction, and job placement. The standard also goes on to say that retention is a key indicator of student satisfaction within a program. So, how in the world do we collect all of the data associated with each of these areas, what would be the appropriate data or what would be inappropriate and how do we go about collecting that? If we can look at the next slide, this is an example given by a program owner where they have constructed program outcome rates and they have based those rates um, 
or compared those rates to their goal for their program. These goals were likely set either through um, the advisory committee input, through the administration of the institution, or maybe a combination of both. So here, it's very easy to compare how well this program did um, in terms of its effectiveness related to its standard in terms of what actually happened against the goals set for the program. Very nicely concise. If we can move now to the next slide, we'll talk about how strategic planning impacts the, the quality of the program. In our strategic planning efforts within the pharmacy technology programs, a need survey uh, should be conducted and periodically throughout the life of the program because needs change, practice changes. And in doing so, we need to understand what, what is available, what is expected, and what the gap is. And that gap then can be fed into uh, strategic planning. We need to also think about short-term goals related to our programs and long-term goals and the identification of those. A short-term goal may simply be um, you want to establish a, a class of 15 and you currently have 13. How, how could you make that a short-term goal? But if your class was that you have 15 and you want to have a class of 30, that may be a longer term goal. And that's just one example. How will you, what strategies will you use to achieve these goals and the, and, and the type of data surrounding that? And then how well have you progressed through the achievement of these goals? Our next uh, slide really does speak to a nice example of the types of data and how to collect this. I really appreciate the fact that this is um, a one-page document. Very easy to read in terms of the goal for the program established by the uh, or assisted by the advisory committee along with the, the institution. Then on the left hand column. Along the top you not only have the goal but the related objectives to that goal. When or a timeline to expect that that will happen. Who specifically is that assigned to? What, you, what type of measurement or instrument or assessment will you use to know that you've reached it? And then a column to say, hey did I make it or not? Also, this particular example gives us the data source for what type of outcomes assessment is going on here. Again, these goals relate to the program outcomes, not specifically the learning outcomes. As we move into the final leg about the pres or for the presentation today, let's talk about the student experience and how, how it relates to the quality of the program. So our student experience is actually a compilation of um, the environment the student's in, the effects of the learning on the student, and then the encounter with the knowledge that they have. So it's kind of a three-pronged um, aspect of experience. Excuse me. But it starts with the program orientation and information session. Whenever you as a program owner or a program owner meets for the first time with that student to speak to what the expectations are of the program. In that environment, 
or in that session or in that orientation, all of the data collected related to uh, the accreditation standard that you must cover this and you must tell the student that and you, um, you must have provide evidence of the student's identity. All of those points of data must be collected and organized. In doing that, each piece then becomes a part of your program outcomes, your accreditation story. It all feeds on each other. Again, start with the end in mind. Create your program orientation and your information session not only with the items that you must cover, but that you wish to cover with that student. Additionally, use the syllabus for each of your courses to identify the course objectives and how it relates to the program objectives or the program outcomes. Introduce the terminology of outcomes in this particular environment. If you start the student learning, if you start with the student in learning about outcomes assessment from the very beginning, it will be an expected part of their learning experience. Also, Look at the physical environment the student is in and assess that. What type of learning occurs in the physical environment that they are in? Is it a cramped space? Um, is it, do, do the students have plenty of supplies to work with? Again, using that data share with your advisory committee and work it into your strategic plan, into your short and long-term goals. So, so not only are you using your student experience from the program orientation, you're asking them to evaluate their physical environment, their emotional experience, their learning, and bring all of that feedback then back into the program and use that feedback to enhance the learning experience. If we can go to the next slide, it will give you an example of questions on a student survey instrument that could be not only used for the student, again, to self-identify what their experience has been in this learning but also these are the same type questions that could be used as a program director and as a clinical coordinator and again that triangulates the evidence making it stronger so long as these items have been connected to your accreditation standard they are aligned and provide additional pieces of quality for knowing that your students have achieved their outcomes. All right, so that we have a few minutes left at the end of our presentation, we have one more slide. And the final slide is really the place where, where hopefully each of these elements of quality, accreditation, assessment, come together and make us ask the questions not only ask the question, but answer the question. So now that we've done all of this, do we need to make any changes to our curriculum? Do we change how students come into our programs? Do we, did we identify maybe some opportunities that we needed for professional development for ourselves? Were there other things that possibly you thought of uh, in terms of needing more equipment or uh, maybe changing your short-term and long-term 
goals, or maybe your job practice analysis helped you, helped you to know that, that quite possibly you didn't have uh, the right people on your advisory committee anymore. Maybe your, your market changed and it's not reflective of all of those that are um, in the practice setting any longer. As we look at assessment, we just simply need to recognize that there will likely be more questions that we need to ask or approaches that we need to make. And if we are honest with ourselves, assessment will help us to either affirm our actions and then we get new questions or simply evaluate our processes to know if they're effective. But ultimately, assessment is about the learning the student has encountered. We each want our students to be successful. Allow assessment data to help that occur so that the quality within the programs you teach, that you administer, are the highest that they can be. And with that in mind, let's uh, advance through the next couple of slides showing the resources that were used here along with the links. And I believe that wraps up anything that I have Jason, and I'm going to send it back to you for questions that have either come in or comments that we need to make. Thank you so much, Janet, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. We do appreciate you sharing your knowledge and experience with ASHP accreditation uh, in relation to pharmacy technician training programs. We have received a few questions. And I will allow a moment to allow uh, the audience to ask additional questions as necessary. I would like to take this moment to remind everyone of our upcoming webinar entitled Easy Path to Using Student iPads on Exam Day, presented by Brother Christopher D. Hall of the Bergen Catholic High School in New Jersey. This webinar will focus on streamlining the exam process using iPads and is scheduled for tomorrow, Wednesday, May 20th, at 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, please visit learn.examsoft.com forward slash resources for more information and to register. This presentation is recorded. Within the next few days, all attendees and registrants will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this presentation. Do please feel free to share this resource with your colleagues as you see fit. So we ha do have a few questions. The first question is, can you discuss how uh, this type of data and research can be used to also meet requirements for institutional assessment and accreditation? Uh, I'm, I've been a lucky person to participate, uh, to be selected to participate in the SACS process, and I would appreciate any ideas on how I can use this information for institutional accreditation. So that is actually a great question. Um, in the sense that um, applying the philosophy of beginning with the end in mind, by visiting the regional accrediting standard for SACS, find the ways that that particular accreditation standard is asking for program information and then connect that accreditation to your program outcomes. Align those, well, that's what I mean by connecting. Align those two and one will feed the other. Your program uh, outcome data should feed your institutional accreditation. Thank you so much. The next question is, what would be some of your suggestions in having a quote unquote active advisory committee? So, specifically, having an active um, advisory committee 
is really asking the group how best they would communicate. And, and thinking outside the box in terms of quite possibly someone would like to, to be active on your advisory committee, but they can't simply get away from work. What happens if um, you use technology, either through Skype or maybe webinar technology, uh, to include that person? What happens if you maybe even use Google Hangout and bring them uh, into the group? While it would be great for that person to be physically um, in your meeting, at least they could be there virtually. So that's an option. Thank you so much. The next question is, what can a program do to have affordable capital automated equipment for our students with actual software? So by um, using the strategic planning with the long-term and the short-term um, outcomes associated with accreditation, your advisory committee may have connections either through equipment that maybe someone is replacing or Possibly they may know of even grant funds that may be available. There may also be an opportunity to work for, with interprofessional education. Maybe you have a college of pharmacy around you, or if you have a nursing program around you, you may ask them to partner in automated technology because the way that each of those groups then interact with that technology uh, can justify uh, that technology for more than one group. So, so for example, if your nursing program always has a high volume of students and they tend to get uh, large pieces of equipment, you might ask, can, can you write the proposal, include them in that proposal, and together you both get that piece of equipment that you could use in terms of automation. To follow up on the advisory committee question, uh, this audience member states that they have used Adobe Connect or other similar technology, but no one has signed on to the meeting. How do you bring active professionals onto the board in your area? To answer that, have they not signed into the technology, possibly because they don't know how? I don't know the answer to that question for this particular audience member, but Possibly, this topic, such as Adobe Connect or webinar technology, could actually be done as a um, continuing education course or a class for, for the pharmacy community. In other words, maybe it could be CE for them in how to interact with technology. So if the lack of participation is because they do not know how, then you could provide the resource to them in the training and education of how to use the technology. And by doing that, you would also make them aware of your program and the technologies that you could use uh, to get them on board. Our final question is, are you aware if PTAC will begin the standardization of reporting, including updates to forms, uh, or is that a process that will still remain dependent upon uh, each program? So I, to answer that question fairly, 
one of the elements of, of P-tax um, process will be some, some uh, standardization. I don't know the extent, and I'm not uh, I'm not at liberty to speak to that. Um, currently, currently there are talks of having updated uh, standardized forms on uh, available to uh, to the public on ASHP's website. Thank you so much, Janet. This concludes today's presentation. As a reminder, you will have an opportunity to participate in the seven question survey. We encourage everyone to complete this survey so that we may continue to provide relevant content in all future presentations. Those who complete the survey will be entered into a drawing for a $25 gift card to Amazon.com. Thank you so much, Janet, for taking the time today to share your passion and expertise in programmatic and institutional accreditation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. Have a great day.